uh, call the meeting of the Sunderland Elementary School Committee to order uh, 5 p.m. September 20th. And we'd like to start off by giving the floor to Ben. You muted. I think that should do it. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to the first uh, school committee meeting of the new school year. Um, I wanted to start off the meeting by just recognizing um, one of our dear educators. So over the summer, our beloved former colleague, Catherine Lorenz passed away unexpectedly. Miss Kate, as she was referred to by our students, served as one of our preschool teachers for many years and was deeply loved and cherished by her students and colleagues. Uh, Kate's beautiful personality was the perfect match for that of a preschool teacher. Uh, she was also a very talented musician and we would often hear laughter and songs coming from the preschool classroom. She also had the natural gift of connecting with all of our young learners, especially those who had various learning styles and disabilities. We wanna thank Catherine Lorenz for all that she gave to our school community. Uh, she will always be missed, um, but always loved. Thank you. Muted, Craig. You're muted, Craig. Thank you, Ben, very moving. And with that, I'd like to uh, pass an introduction to uh, Dr. Laura Ramsey. Thank you very much. It's nice to meet everybody who I haven't met already. And um, I'm looking forward to this school year, this adventure and the current projects. Um, I'm happy to say a few things about some of the current projects if the agenda is not too packed or I can yield my time, as they say. I defer to the school committee. By all means, let's let's hear a little bit. Okay. Um, well, I'm joining the school district after five years of being a director at the Hilltown K through eight charter school in East Hampton. And that after 18 years of teaching fourth and sixth grade at the Smith College Campus School and teaching courses in education for Smith College in Westfield State. And um, this is really what all of my efforts and interests have been building towards is this, um, I guess, honed focus in elementary curriculum. And I have been so appreciative of the warm welcome and the lovely um, transition to being here at Frontier. Um, I had thought that we would, that I would take more time to get used to and get more familiar with the communities and the curriculums and the teachers before jumping into projects. But I learned very quickly that everyone's eager to get moving on a few um, big ticket items that were put on hold during the pandemic. And it feels good to be actually jumping in after all. So we are um, working on two projects in particular, um, unifying the district around a, a math curriculum is one and unifying the district around an English language arts curriculum is another. Um, and those are two headliners. We are also working on health and um, a safe and supportive schools grant and a comprehensive um, services health grant. Um, and we even have a civics grant for grades three, four, five with some access to primary source curriculum materials that are uh, state of the art. So there is a lot actually happening considering it's not even the first 100 days. But thank you for um, having me at your meeting. Thanks so much for coming and appreciate the, uh, yeah, it sounds like you are definitely jumping in with both feet. All right. Uh, we have a, a motion to uh, approve the minutes of June 14th. So moved. All right. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Let's see, Peter? All right. Jessica? Yes. Megan? Yes. Greg? Yes. Okay. Uh, unanimous. We'll, we'll catch up with uh, Keith later. Uh,
financial statements and signing of the warrants. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I did send you out the expense reports through August 31st, uh, as well as my uh, short narrative. Uh, so there were 43 warrants signed over the summer months. So the warrants included uh, bills being paid for the months of June, July, and August. The total on those 43 warrants was 400,000, sorry, let me try that again, $465,417.92. Um, and just to give you a little bit of an update on where we are since June, I, I don't have revolving funds reconciled with the town yet, so that is a pretty lengthy process. And you know, I know you all know this, but just to let everybody know, it's done five times over because we're doing all five schools. So um, it's pretty extensive and lengthy. We're through um, three out of the four elementary schools, so Sunderland's coming up next. Uh, so hopefully next month I will have an update for you on revolving accounts. I will let you know that generally, uh, there's not a major concern in any of those accounts right now, but I'll give you more details next month. And then uh, as a follow-up to the June meeting, we had talked about excess budget funds in June. Uh, ben and the school uh, were working on purchasing some additional supplies and materials and equipment. Uh, we did some deferred maintenance kind of pieces that came up uh, over the summer months, um, pressure washing the building, um, replacing some exterior doors that needed to be replaced, uh, the glass in them. I'm not sure if they were fogged or actually broken, but we did replace those doors. Uh, some equipment was purchased for the playground and for outdoor use. So replacing our basketball hoops, replacing soccer goals, um, two-way radios were bought, some carpets were replaced. You know, there was a wide variety of things purchased uh, I think Ben did a really good job of trying to meet the needs of everyone that was in the building, um, classroom needs, uh, PE needs, recess needs, you know, and other building things. So that was great to be able to do because typically um, Sunderland is, you know, one of the schools that's at a standstill. So it was nice to be able to actually spend some money uh, on, on extra things that we weren't anticipating being able to buy. Um, and we had also talked about there being uh, excess funds beyond some of those things that we were purchasing. And I explained at the June meeting that we would do a transfer of funds remaining in the budget to school choice for future use. So that transaction was just shy of $44,000 that we moved over to school choice. We had talked about reserving some of that in the special education account. I ended up leaving it in school choice um, and I have it earmarked when you look at the school choice expense report, you will see that there is a $20,000 placeholder in there. That's not planned to be spent on anything. It's really just a holding spot um, because we had talked about trying to build up the special education revolving fund. Um, and, and rather than having those funds so restricted, we ended up putting them in choice. So they're available there for us. So there's a very healthy balance. I want to say it's around 500,000 in school choice, which is really significant compared to where we've been in prior years. Uh, I think that covers everything for an update from last year, unless anyone has questions on any of that. And then I can talk quickly about the current year and where we're at. I think, okay. Um, so I did send you the expense reports. The only account that I'm keeping an eye on right now is maintenance and repairs. I believe we talked about this last year. Uh, Sunderland school maintenance and repair line is 20,500 for the year. One third of that immediately comes off the top for the energy management contract with Siemens. It's something that we need to do in order to maintain the controls in the building, but we really should look going into the next budget cycle of possibly moving that expense to testing and inspections because it's really not repairs, it's regular routine thing that we have contracted just like our sprinkler systems, we have a contract for those to be reviewed every year. Um, but regardless of what line it's in, I do think we should increase the maintenance budget, whichever line it falls, um, by the amount of the contract or, or roughly around the amount of the contract, just so that we really have the full $20,500 available for repairs and maintenance. We all know that the building needs things. Our, our capital list is extensive. We tackle some small things when we can, but we really can't afford to lose uh, $7,500 from that repair line for a maintenance agreement. So I'll be pushing forward with that during budget season to increase the maintenance budget by that amount. Um, we have had some other repairs. The cement board replacement came up during the 
um, playground project. So there was some uh, rot around that bottom baseboard of the building. So that was almost $5,000 that we were not expecting to have to pay um, this year. I mean, it's, you know, pros and cons of finding the problem and, and fixing it before it gets even worse. Um, but it's $5,000 we were not expecting. And while it what came up during the playground project, it wasn't a playground expenditure. So we could not um, charge the playground accounts for that fee. Uh, and then we've had some other things come up. We've spent about $2,500 on various um, sprinkler system and fire alarm system. Um, maintenance. And again, they come through the building, they look at all of the emergency exit signs, make sure that all of that is working, make sure that the functionality of the sprinkler system is um, to where it needs to be. So, you know, that's $8,000 roughly that's come right off the top of that budget. So when you take the energy management and then those unforeseen expenditures, we're really, really don't have a ton of money left in that account. So just keeping an eye on that. Uh, the other thing I noted in, I think, think in my report or my email, um, we are working on salary and wage allocations for each employee still. So you're going to see those salary account lines. They look a little funny right now. Some are way overspent, some are way underspent. This first month of payroll, we're always trying to clean up and map out where all the employees are being billed uh, to. So Brenda and I are working on that and the October report should be nice and clean for you to take a look at and see where we're actually at at the end of the year. Uh, and I don't have anything else unless there's specific questions. Anyone? Hey, are, go ahead, Peter. Um, are you, do you want to, will you say something separately about how things stand as far as the uh, playground project and the finances on that? Yeah, Ben's going to talk about the playground project in his principal's report, so I don't want to steal the thunder there, okay. but as far as finances, um, we have had some change orders, and you know, I'm glad to report that we've had funding to take care of those change orders, because um, some things inevitably come up throughout the project that have to be modified. Uh, and you know, we're on track to get all of the things that Ben anticipated purchasing, uh, and even a couple of extra things that we didn't anticipate purchasing, I think, are, are coming in the pipeline with available funds. So we're in good shape, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think that one thing that um, we need to make sure we do it as this project ends is uh, to report back to the to the community preservation committee uh, with the you know where it all stands as it gets wrapped up because um, you know that's just part of at some point we're going to go back to them for money for other things and so you want to leave the best possible impression on this one uh, as far as being responsible with with, with how we spend their money. Absolutely. Thanks. Outstanding. Any other questions? All right. Then on to the uh, principal's report. Uh, ben, the floor is yours again. Thanks. So over the summer, uh, many members of our teaching team helped to prepare for this school year in a few different capacities. Uh, one, we had a book study group, and this was facilitated by our sixth grade teacher, Nicole Walsh, and our English learner teacher, Matthew Howell, for the book, Families with Power. And we had multiple staff members participate in this. The book uh, focused on issues relating to academics and race, and the work that this group did uh, was very empowering, and uh, we're already implementing some of the ideas from the book and uh discussions that came came from that book facilitation. Additionally, our building-based strategic team met a couple times over the summer to plan for this year. This team is made up of uh, faculty members from across all the grade levels and various disciplines. And uh, the main focus this summer was to look at our school climate and the rollout of becoming a responsive classroom school across all settings. Um, in my initial communication to our community at the end of August, we talked about how the responsive classroom approach was going to focus on the school-wide rule development, positive language, interactive modeling, and age-appropriate logical consequences, and also caregiver partnership. Um, the rollout this school year has gone very, very smoothly, 
And um, additionally, we sent out a survey to families last week for the establishment of the school-wide rules. Our students and teachers have been working hard to develop individual classroom rules, and we'll be looking at um, all of that information um, moving forward and coming up with a set of rules uh, that will be followed across all the schools. Um, additionally, our strategic team is going to meet throughout this year, um, and we're going to prioritize a few different things. Um, one, community building within the school, um, school events, and then responsive classroom data, instructional software, and also instructional models. Um, additionally, uh, Vicki Palmer, our school counselor and psychologist, Jacqueline Petrino, our third grade teacher, and Rachel Kidder, our school library media specialist, met on a few different occasions this summer to, um, to continue work with our safe and supportive schools project. Um, immediate actions from this group resulted in welcome baskets of responsive classroom materials for classroom teachers and um, other faculty members. Um, additionally, we're putting the final touches on another survey that's going to go out soon within the next few weeks. And that's going to be um, for both students in the upper grades and our families across all grade levels. That survey is going to focus on school climate um, uh, to help us support the social emotional well-being of our students and families. Um, additionally, uh, as we're transitioning into the new school year, we're going to continue to prioritize the health and safety of our students, teachers, and families. You know, over the past couple of years, so much time, energy, and effort has been spent on the management and operations uh, procedures here at school, and it's going to be really nice to, uh, while keeping that at the forefront, also looking at um, the various systems of support that we have at the school. Um, so that includes our multi-tiered system of supports and our school improvement plan. Um, additionally, our special education team, um, which has a few new team members, are go going to be establishing both short and long-term goals for our school. And we have plan to have that reflected in our school improvement plan um, through the work with our school council. And then finally, uh, so... The Early Childhood Playground is in the final stages of completion. The poured in place rubber surfacing, which, which was really the last big project for this, for the installation, is being installed this week. Uh, the company was out here yesterday and today um, putting down a couple different layers. There's going to be a 48 to 72 hour curing process. And then hopefully by the end of this week, um, and or at the start of next week, our youngest students will have access to this incredible space. I do want to take this time to recognize um, those who really helped with this um, project, including uh, various Town of Sunderland commu uh, committees, private community member monetary donors, uh, the Sunderland Elementary School PTO, the sixth grade classes of 2019 20 and 21, the Danielle Zinn Memorial Fund, Delta Sand and Gravel Incorporated, All States Materials Group Charitable Fund, USA Waste and Recycling, the Home Depot Foundation, Northampton Pediatric Dentistry, and the B. Gorey Fabrication Company. Um, when uh, we are able to uh, get the sign put in, it's going to um, dedicate the playground to the hardworking teachers of Sunderland Elementary School. And uh, some upcoming events. We have a uh, school council meeting next Monday at 315. Our open house welcome back to school night is going to be from 5 to 7 p.m. next Tuesday, September 27th. Uh, this evening is going to look a little different than it has in the past. Um, we are going to welcome the community for a free pizza, salad, and cookie dinner. Um, following that, there's going to be a school-wide photography event where each and every family will be able to receive a um, free family portrait um, for, for their homes. And then we'll also take that the second um, photo of each family and create a school-wide mural within the school here as a way to um, establish a sense of community and bringing everyone closer together. There's going to be scavenger hunts, um, meet and greets with staff uh, and families. So we're really looking forward to this incredible evening. 
And, um, and then moving forward from there, some of our early release and staff meeting dates, we're bringing um, uh, Sarah Rigney in from Bright. And um, Sarah is going to help um, our staff uh, and do professional development. And this is going to be ongoing on six different occasions throughout the year. And she's going to tie in um, her work with uh, uh, giving us a trauma-informed approach, responsive classroom, and second step, which is our social-emotional uh, curriculum. And on October 7th is our walk-in roll to school day. We are entering year number 11 for that. So, uh, so there you have it. Uh, the school year has gone uh, started off very smoothly, and it's so great to um, see all the families and students back again. Um, I will say that we had our PTO meeting at the school last night, and um, with this this is my ninth year here at Sunderland, and we have not had a PTO meeting that has had a bigger turnout than the one this year with close to 25 people showing up um, across all grade levels and demographics. So that felt um, really powerful and energizing, and we're looking to, to keep the work going. Outstanding. Thank you, Ben. Yep. Any, any questions for Ben? Yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Uh, yeah, so Ben, with the transition to um, implementing responsive classroom techniques all around the school, can you talk to us about what sort of training is being offered to teachers? Sure, absolutely. So um, there's a, a few different things happening. Um, one, we uh, on, on the opening day, we went over some basic guidelines. So school-wide singles for attention. So how we get the kids' attention in, in the common spaces, in the hallways, in the cafeteria. Um, and on the playground, we also from from there went over our, our recess guidelines. And you know, recess is one of the most important times of the day for the students. Um, yet also many kids struggle during this area. So one of the changes that we've made this year, which has been met with just incredible success, and you know, we Hopefully, are not still in the honeymoon period, but we're being pro that proactive about everything. And so, at the beginning of every recess, um, students and staff in that particular cohort circle up on the blacktop, and this is across all grade levels, and just review the expectations for the day. If um, things were a little tough the day before, we might revisit expectations for a certain game um, or a piece of um, or play equipment. Um, and then at the end of each recess. We're getting together and just doing check-ins with the with the students as well. Um, from there, uh, this past spring, many of our special education teachers and classroom teachers uh, had a one-day intro to responsive classroom training over at Frontier, and this is something that we did district-wide um, with all the elementary schools and some of the middle school teachers as well. And for any faculty member that did not have that training this past spring whether it's a new teacher an instructional assistant or um or a new someone else new to the building um on september 9th and 16th i led a morning training with with all of those staff members those trainings um focused on the use of positive adult language um and really like the power of our words and how we communicate with students and with one another we talked about interactive modeling, which is a key component of, of the responsive classroom approach. With that, um, the teachers are explicitly teaching um, the routines of a specific um, concept, whether it's you know in the early childhood classroom, how to go from the rug to choice time or in the upper grades, like how to collect materials or what does partner work look like? What does um, choosing a partner look like when it's time to form form groups. Um, another part of that training in, in included age appropriate lots of, uh, logical consequences, and that is one of our next steps as a as an entire staff um, in terms of like redirecting um, potentially off task behavior. Part of the training the last two Fridays also included. Um, using reinforcing language right when we're noticing students being on task or doing what's inspected, uh, what's expected, using reminding language just when students are starting to go off task or 
when they're le- when they're about to start something that might be potentially difficult. Um, a game out at recess, transitioning in the hallway, um, ex- following expectations and the the unstructured time in the cafeteria, and then redirecting language when a student um, needs that <laughs> redirection and is off task, um, and, and all using this as teachable moments. Um, through the responsive classroom approach, it is as much, it emphasizes that the, a student's social emotional skills are as important as all academic skills that are taught, um, you know, throughout their time here, here at school. Um, so, and then on, at early release on September 16th, we, had another training. Um, This was a full staff training that solely focused on positive adult language, where different scenarios were brought up and we practiced and and rehearsed. Um, I mentioned the school-wide rules Uh, earlier in the year. um, Up to this point, classes have each individual classroom, pre-K through six, have been identifying their hopes and dreams for the year, and then also establishing, establishing classroom rules. From there, we are going to be taking what we um, those individual classroom rules along the, with the feedback that we uh, have received from the caregiver survey, and then taking one student from each of the fourth through sixth grade classes, and then those students with um, some support from adults will then look at the all of the rules, find the commonalities, and create school-wide rules that will go off from, from there. You know, the importance of the school-wide rules is to help tie behavior back to those. So, um, you know, an example, I, you know, sometimes the early childhood bathroom paper towels might end up on the floor um, for whatever reason, missing the basket, three-point shot, or it's just fun to kind of make a mess in there as well. Um, so we'd be able to use that as a teachable moment. Hey, remember our school I rule is one of our school-wide rules is being respectful. What does being respectful look like in this situation? So again, tying everything thing back to that. Um, moving forward, we'll be dedicating staff time in or staff meeting time to the responsive classroom approach. Um, just at, at the end of the early release um, this past Friday, we split up into cohorts pre-KK, one, two, three, four, and five, six. And all the faculty and staff reflected on what was working really well and um, what needed to, what we could like tighten up on. And so some examples of of those discussions, like pre-KK, they identified that the transition from recess to lunch uh, has been difficult up to this point. So they strategize on, on, on some things that would help that make a little bit uh, go a little bit smoother. Grade one, two um, focused on morning meeting and how that could, um, how all students would be able to access that morning meeting approach. Grade three, I forget what that focus was, but five, six um, also dealt with transitions from like recess down to the, to the cafeteria. Moving forward, we'll continue to visit the, revisit these topics in staff meetings there is um, plans with with Dr. Ramsey for there to be a um, one day uh, um, administration training as as well um, done by Responsive Classroom, and we're looking um, we're just waiting for that to to become available to us. I had mentioned our work with uh, Sarah Rigney as as well, um, and she's going to be tying in trauma informed practices, responsive classroom and second step and how they all tie together. And then um, additionally, we are uh, we have an abundance of, of resources in this area and we used funds um, at the end of last year to um, purchase materials for for individual um, cohorts in the school. Um, uh, w- whether it's a, a book about responsive classroom school discipline or the first six weeks of school or positive adult language. So it's been very, very positive rollout up to this point. And, um, and the last thing I wanted to mention on this was uh, a few years ago, we had um, established a set of school-wide expectations in our common areas, um, assemblies, cafeteria, bathrooms, hallways, and so the other part that we've been doing 
is really reinforcing each of these expectations when students are transitioning out of the classroom and going to another spot or going or opening assembly of the year. We had our sixth grade student ambassadors um, perform some skits on the different expectations for, for each area in the school to help reinforce what we're doing. So all in all, that's it's been very positive. We'll continue the discussions um, throughout the school year. And um, so that's what we have have planned right now. Any questions or suggestions about the rollout? I, I'm still curious to know, um, it sounds like the training so far has been in-house. Who is leading it and what is their responsive classroom background? I've been leading the classes. I have been leading the trainings in-house. And although I've had no formal responsive classroom training other than the one day, um, the one day training this past um, this past spring, we looked at um, we looked at different options. The responsive classroom does offer a four day training um, to the tune of I think probably around twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars, and you know that's difficult to have put in during the school year. Um, and there's also you know some we have some great experts on our on our staff as well who have been through this training in the past. Um, who have had their their classrooms who, who have, have followed this model, and it's been very, very successful. I think my first visit ever to Sunderland Elementary was to do my responsive classroom training back in 2010. I didn't even live in town yet. So. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yep. yep. And, um, and, and so the, the other piece is that we're, we're really trying to implement the different principles like with with fidelity so every classroom and we, we've put this on our master schedule this year that um the younger classrooms have settled in time than morning meeting but at 8 40 on our master schedule every single classroom has the morning meeting and that allows um it allows students with the opportunity to connect with their peers preview the day know what is know what's expected um, discuss any things that came up the day before um, and really sets them up for success. We found that our early childhood classrooms really can't start with the morning meeting right away and they need some settle in choice time. And so they have their, their morning meeting after that um, settle in time. From there, um, there's um, midday reflections where the um, the teacher classroom teachers, and usually this is happening happens following the the lunch period, where the students check in with their teacher again to see how the day is going, and then a few times a week we're also doing closing circles um, to recap how how things are go went during the school day. Additionally, um, we have every faculty member um, and staff member that's not directly connected with a classroom. Um, so not the classroom teacher and not the para that's supporting the students in that room, but everyone else, they're also attending one to two, one to two morning meetings per week, again, in an effort to build community and, and to really, um, communicate to the students that we're all, we're all in this learning experience together. Outstanding. And any more on that? All right. There's, like there's one other thing I'm wondering about, but maybe it's going to come in the superintendent's report about the preschool schedule change. Darius, are you going to talk about that or should I ask Ben? I can talk about it. Um, okay, we can save it for later. Thanks. All right. All right. And I believe we're on to public comment. Do I send. Uh, Victoria Palmer was planning to say something this evening. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Victoria Palmer, and I'm a proud member of the Sunderland Elementary School community, a school psychologist and school counselor, and co-president of the Union 38 Educators Association. The association and I would want to thank you for voting to endorse the fair share amendment last spring through your resolution in support of the fair share amendment. 
The fair share amendment is a proposal to amend the Massachusetts Constitution, creating an additional tax of four percentage points on the portion of a person's annual income above one million. The new revenue generated by the tax, approximately $2 billion a year, would be spent on public education, affordable public colleges and universities, and the repair and maintenance of roads, bridges, and public transportation. To ensure that the tax continues to apply only to the highest income taxpayers who have the ability to pay more, the 1 million threshold would be adjusted each year to reflect cost of living increases. To help working families and build a stronger economy for us all, we need to make sure we have quality public schools for our children, affordable public higher education, and a transportation system that works. Without investments in these common goals, working families fall behind and our communities suffer. Right now, the highest income households in Massachusetts, those in the top 1%, pay a smaller share of their income in state and local taxes than any other income group. Our wealthiest residents can clearly afford to pay a little more to fund the investments we all need. Once again, thank you for your endorsement of this very important amendment and vote yes on one. All righty, thank you for that. Uh, Anyone else have public comment this evening? All right. Uh, then, since there's no unfinished business, uh, on to new business. Capital improvement and summer uh, repairs report. Yeah, I guess I'll jump in there. Um, it's just basically going through a lot of the things we've already talked about. We have, we have a lot of moving parts happening in Sunderland, so um, I just want to touch upon a few other ones. Um, I'm not going to read through ones, but just one. probably need some feedback. Um, we do have um, the oil the oil, oil tank uh, engineering is actually a meeting next week. And um, we are working with Ty and Bond on that. Um, they're coming out to um, to be doing doing that work. So they haven't really, the first meeting, I think the first on-site meeting is with them um, next week. So that, that's what's happening there. The um, oil tank gauge um, and uh, detection system has been replaced and up and running. Um, and I think Ben kind of talked about the cement board, the custodial equipment, the cafeteria equipment has been put in, uh, basketball hoops. Let me just make sure I got everything on my list here. Um, um, the new boiler is expected to arrive in mid-October, around the 15th. And the sewer pump, which is always exciting, um, it just came in. It's also going to be installed in the next few weeks as well. Um, and then, as I think Shelly talked about earlier, we played three of the glass door exits um, um, outside the gym because they needed new hardware. They weren't shutting properly and such. So those are kind of the, the add-on to the lists. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding the lists? The list that I sent out, I think, in August? Peter? Peter? Yeah, I, I didn't see anything about the windows on the south side on, on that list. I was wondering if I know we that. Not, right, we haven't moved forward on that yet. So that's going to have to go out to bid and, and all the other good stuff there. So um, right now that's not on. We're looking to do that probably next, next summer. And, and the other more general question is that in talking to Jeff, town administrator, at this, some point earlier this summer, he said that uh, he'd ask you and Ben maybe to work on, you know, the plan looking forward for just the major capital items because we're hoping to to get really some progress on that in terms of the planning uh, and the financing, uh, how we might approach it. And so I wondered if um, if that's in progress. Yeah, so Ben and I had a meeting with Jeff, probably, what was it, August, was it early August, um, to kind of go through the different major projects to, um, you know, talking about what's coming down the pipe. 
Um, yeah, we basically have that kind of outlined in our capital planning as well. Um, and so they can just get a general, excuse me, with all departments. So I think ours is in, I want to say, it's probably more expensive shape in the sense there's more li on the list, but we have our lists. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's what he may have been talking to you about. Peter? Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. I'm just, you know, I'm looking forward to like later this fall and beginning of the winter. And that is that the more that um, we tend often to get a late start on this so that by the time we're sort of coming up against, OK, what can we manage in the budget? We haven't really done all the homework that we should have for for getting our priorities straight and, you know, some stuff, whether it's, you know, for the coming budget cycle or whether it's two or three or four cycles down the road or whatever. But the more we can, you know, have, as they say, have our ducks lined up early. It just it just helps us because, um, you know, we, some of this is going to be able to we, we have a fair bit in the way of resources available, but not necessarily for the really big projects, for the really big projects. We're still going to have to come up away with financing, like, for example, the school roof. Um, you know, the other one that comes to mind immediately is whether there's going to be a big number on an oil tank, uh, um, so on. You know, on the other hand, we sure are getting a lot done, and I know that 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 Bill Hildreth must have had a busy, busy summer, give, given all the things that have been getting done. So that part is great. It's just we need to keep at it um, until we've sort of got you know everything pegged in a way that we're going to take care of it. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't know. I'm kind of push back slightly on that. I think we are organized in that area, and that's how we were able to move quickly when we had this. All of a sudden, it was ARPA funding. We had a list of was shifting what could be capital next year, the fall, this year or the following year and putting that on our list and the town supporting that. Um, I think, you know, the things like um, the oil tank, which we've been talking about for years um, and then kind of creeping up as a, like, you know, a major issue. And, you know, the roof is just every year it gets older, you know, so we, we can hold on to that roof for another 10 years, you know what I mean? Or is it going to start with, you know, what is the leak kind of issues on that? So, I mean, we are the, the natural progression that I have is that October is kind of capital improvement is capital improvement month where we get all our capital plans in order. Um, most committees want those plans by December. That's kind of the, uh, the fall, you know, the kind of the breakdown there. So that's kind of in my mind, I'll have all those, those lined up. I don't know what we do about planning out on things that are outside our control or we have to have the rest of other town leadership involved with. We talk about the, the roofing and how to package that. You know, oh, you know that that's 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 for the, you know, the town as a whole to be figuring out, and and you know it like a lot of this stuff this past year. I mean, we had a great, you know, the past twelve months in terms of what you've all been managing to get done and get approved and get funding for has been great. And we just, you know, we got it. I I think we got the right process going on. We've just not done yet. So we got to, you know, we got to keep keep at it for this next budget cycle. And I think we can make a bunch more progress because. We got a lot of support at town hall. And so, you know, it's just to make sure that, you know, whenever it's called on us to provide information or to get, you know, the quotes or the bids or the whatever it is that we take care of that, you know, in a, uh, promptly and, and so on. And you know, like I said, we've got a lot of support. I, I, I think I was, I was confused on, let me know. So, you know, we'll obviously I'll have that capital improvement report. Um, you know, probably for the October meeting, um, at least in its, in its in a draft, then we can kind of go from there um, in building that. Um, you know, yeah, that would that that would be great. Yep. All right. Let's see. Substitute pay. It sounds like uh, we're we're looking for a vote there. Yeah, I'm looking, uh, currently we pay uh, $93 a day. Um, I would like to move that up to $100 a day. Um, and it puts us in competitive with our, more competitive with our neighbors. Um, keeps us not the highest paid, but kind of near the upper middle. Um, and I think we need to continue looking at increasing that each year as, um, you know, as substitutes are, are very hard to get to begin with. And um, it's a very hard job. And um, you know, the, we're competing jobs are the job market's tighter and tighter. So we need to recognize that. So, um, it does, the previous means I've listed off other areas, whether other area schools are, you want me to do that? I have. Uh, 
Um, you know, basically what other schools are paying for substitute Belcher Town pays $100 a day. Gateway pays $100 a day. Granby pays 75 with a master's. Greenfield pays um, 100 with a degree, 105 for certified. We don't differentiate. We do a straight we do a straight um, coverage fee. Um, Hadley does 80 uncertified, 85 certified. Halffield does 90 certified, 80 uncertified. Mahar 95. Mohawk $15 an hour. I don't know how many hours they work, so that's not really helpful. And then Northampton's 120. So I'm looking to move it to 100. Good. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we increase substitute pay to $100 a day. Second. Any further discussion? I get it. Um, Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. School lunch program update. Shelly? <clears throat> Okay, so when we met in June, we did not know at that point if lunch uh, meals, actually breakfast and lunch was going to be universally free for all students. I'm sure you've seen some of the articles and heard about the state budget. The state did approve to support uh, universal meals. So breakfast and lunch remains free for all students. Um, one thing that the state is asking us to do is uh, encourage families to complete the school lunch application because the reimbursement rate is based on whether families qualify for free lunch, reduced lunch, or are cash paying. Um, so my understanding is that the state is reimbursing what um, the federal maximum is for a free student. Uh, so they really want us to keep a close uh, count on those meals month to month. So, um, Ben, if you have a newsletter or anything going out, I think you guys put them out um, paper to students, I think Leela told me. But if you have something going out and you can add that in there, encouraging families to fill out the applications, they can send them into central office. We'll review them uh, and take care of it from there. It's sort of a tricky situation because families don't have to apply for free or reduce in order to be eligible this year because it's free for everybody. So it's been a little bit challenging for us in these first few weeks to get applications in, but the state's really wanting us to make sure that families are doing that if they qualify. And then of course, there's other benefits that families may qualify for in the process, um, whether the pandemic EBT continues, uh, that was something that was put in place last year that gave additional money to qualifying families. Um, that may be in place, and then uh, SNAP and other benefits like that that they may qualify for that they don't realize. So um, that we just wanted you to have a little bit of update, make sure that everyone knows that meals, breakfast, and lunch are free for all students. Um, our school lunch account balance is in better shape than it's probably ever historically been district-wide. Um, so that's promising. Uh, we will work to reserve funds as much as we can this year because if the state flips and goes back to cash paying, uh, we have no idea really what lunches will look like. We can look at historical data uh, pre-pandemic to see what our numbers were like, but I think it's going to be a, a big shift in the community. So um, we want to make sure that we're prepared for that in the future. Outstanding. Any questions? All right. On to the uh, MO. You with the uh, instruction assistance uh, pay steps? Yeah, so um, in this particular thing, you do have the ability to go to executive session because it does have to do with the contract, but we were able to do, do this in open session and at other meetings. So um, I'll leave it up to you if you feel that. I'll explain it. And then if folks feel like they need to talk privately about it, we can do that. Um, so basically, in our uh, with our unit C, um, contract, what we had done is we had removed the bottom two steps and put anybody on those first and second steps onto step three. Okay. And the issue that comes with that is that anybody we hired new this year also is on step three. And so it kind of feels like when it, this does not affect many people and show you know how many affects in Sunderland by any chance? I, I want to say two or three. Okay. Um, it was yeah we under the total number it was it was around ten total in the whole district. But what has happened is that those those uh, IAs who have moved to step three 
are now not being recognized for any steps of experience. Um, this is something that probably should have been handled in negotiations. We probably should, this probably usually something that's usually added to it. It was not. Um, and when talking with the association, I think we both agreed, I will say we all agree, um, that the, um, you know, moving that, those people up one more, one more step to recognize their years of service, um, as well as they are the lowest paid, that's the lowest paid rung in the district. So we're really moving a few people up a little bit more, um, which is part of our goal through negotiations to begin with was to, by eliminating those bottom steps to make those entry levels a little bit higher and more competitive with the job market that's out there and for the value that they do. So, so I'm proposing this, this is, you know, it's a one year, um, you know, it's just for this year, non-precedent setting. So anything in the future will have to be negotiated. Um, and in, then next year we drop another step. It's going to, um, those people will not be affected double because then they can hit again, you know, as an entry level, um, for the following year, because we do, we are dropping another step the following year. We did drop two, and then we drop one, and then no more after that. So um, that makes sense to me. Anyway, your thoughts? Sounds reasonable to me. I uh, always find that the instructional assistants are a great value to the community, provide a lot to the classroom, and uh, definitely help us control our budgets. So uh, I don't know. I don't. Unless anyone else wants to, uh, I don't see a need to go to executive session. All right, uh, I'll move. Uh, Pete, you want to make the motion? Yeah, I just I'll move that uh, uh, we vote to approve the memorandum of understanding with the IA union regarding pay steps. I'll second. All right. Any further discussion? All right, Jessica. Yes. Keith. Yes. Peter. Yes. Megan. Yes. Greg. Yes. All right. Unanimous. Hey, Darius. I think you've been having those signed at the meetings, right, by the chair. Does Greg have to sign? You know, we'll do, I'll send them all out and we'll just do them DocuSign. Okay. I think it's going to be the easiest way. But yeah, Greg will be the one signing the MO. All right. I will um, touch base with Jen to make sure she knows how to do that. Outstanding. All right. Do we have any reports? I know we're just getting back from the summer. Town Park, anything? All right. Uh, collaborative, probably no. Okay. Uh, Darius, superintendent. Yeah, just bringing to life the uh, superintendent report I sent out. Um, we do have a new nurse leader, and we saw her. Um, newsletter that went out yesterday um that's kind of we talked about um through other means different people gave me different feedback one was better communications around health and covid and other health related items in the district um and last year a lot of it funneled through me so this year we just, you know i met with Kara, our new nurse leader and she's going to do um basically every few weeks a newsletter updating on health and what's going on in the district and more if needed um, but trying to do at least once a month what's going on and then her first um, issue, so to speak. Um, she actually had a lot of her nurses also doing contributing writing and such. That was good that they all got, um, they all appreciate getting that voice out to people. There's so many things that go on out of the health offices. Um, as far as COVID right now, um, it is pretty prevalent in our buildings. Um, our, I did a, a statistics as of yesterday. Our statistics aren't, are only what's being reported to the nurse's office. Um, and Currently, Sunderland has no cases, nor was there any testing. Of, well, so there was no testing because they didn't have any cases. Um, not sure how true that is in the sense that the amount of cases that are at Frontier, um, Frontier from the start of school years had 51, I mean, 31 cases rather. And there's been about a half a dozen in the um, elementary schools, um, the other elementary schools, um, six, seven, seven, respectively. So you're seeing little clusters of it. Um, and so forth. So that's kind of what's going on with it. Sunderland is aware of one case. That was as of this morning. My my notes from yesterday. So um yeah, so that's basically the kind of the COVID updates. Um I did I, I do talk talk quite a bit over the summer with Carolyn Ness um and attended the an epidemiologist meeting with the boards of health. Um 
about our particular cases last year and such. So we have an idea what's going on, but right now it is being treated as um, any type of kind of flu that goes through our district. And that's the, uh, the approach the school has been taking and similar to most schools around us. Any questions on COVID or other? The, seeing none. The uh, next thing I made the list was that our early child coordinator, um, Elizabeth Zioli, has left us to go work with Desi. I said she went to the evil, this evil side. Um, since the, my report went out, I have hired a um, hired back Kim, Kim McCarthy, um, who was in this role before being the um, early uh, the uh, what are they the curriculum coordinator for elementary, and so um, so she actually starts tomorrow. So she, happy to have her back, and I think that kind of flows into. Um, Jessica was asking a question about early childhood and preschool on Fridays have a 12 o'clock dismissal for their engaging. This is something that Amy had set up last year. Um, it's set up, they're, they're doing the pyramid model, which is basically MTSS for preschool. And so it's a you know social, emotional competence, um, whole program and curriculum for preschool. Um, and so they're using those afternoons for training. Kim's having to step in. So Amy's leaving timing wise is not great on that in the sense that we started the school year off. Um, so Kim's going to be jumping right in to, to orchestrate um, what that training is going to look like. Ben, were you, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you were hitting on the head. So it's a, a MTSS model for preschool. Um, it, it, makes it helps each building um create a strong foundation um for our youngest learners um there's a big a big part of it is effective um caregiver partnership and relationships and then it really spells out um a series of tiered tiered supports for our students um you know we many times um we are having students come to us through early intervention with identity identified needs um, but then other, other times we're having students um, who are not on, on, not on the radar there and coming to us. And so, you know, early intervention is, is key and it's going to help to build our capacity um, for our youngest learners. Outstanding. All right. Well, I guess... Uh, Take a motion to adjourn. I'll move that. Outstanding. So okay. The second. Uh, let's see. Keith? Yeah. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Craig? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Unanimous.